singers all in red and musicians in red, and you all look so gorgeous together with one another as we celebrate the church alive. It's Pentecost Sunday. It's the Sunday that we celebrate and acknowledge that wonderful birth of the movement of the church. Don't you love to celebrate births, birthdays? We all enjoy those. Birthdays are all listed in the bulletin today for June, and we want to just celebrate with one another these wonderful occasions, honoring births, special moments. We're honoring today the birthday then of the church. And this beautiful passage that we opened up today that you read so beautifully together was, when the day of Pentecost was now come, they were all together in one place. Pentecost. What is Pentecost? What is all this? What's the day of Pentecost? Well, let's break it down because this uh, chapter, the first and second chapter of Acts, full of so much beautiful symbolism, so much that is metaphorically unfolding for us in our lives that we could miss all the nuances that are deep within, that are telling the story within the story. Don't you love it that there's something more to the story than what you're hearing? There's a deeper level, some nuggets of truth that sometimes are covered over as you read through something too quickly or too frivolously and not really paying attention to the story within the story, the meaning behind the meaning, the deeper truth that there for us. Wow, so much symbolism, symbolism galore, for the writers intentionally have written a message to the people that was deep, deep, deep with all kinds of signs and, and trigger moments and words that would say, oh, I get it, and aha, but we may miss them. Let me point out a few. First of all, it's a day of celebration. For the Jewish people, the day of celebration of the first fruits of the harvest, the harvest of that which has been their labors. So we look into that already. The setting of the story is that there is something to be gleaned on the day of Pentecost, something to be received on the day of Pentecost, something to be celebrated on the day of Pentecost that is resulted of time spent and labor spent in working towards a harvest. Next, we see that this is a celebration uh, that takes place 50 days after Passover. And what was Passover? Passover is a celebration of the liberation of the children of Israel coming out of Egypt and this wonderful celebration of liberation from all kinds of bondage. So we look at that and we say, wow, it is a celebration of our own liberation is what it's speaking to us as we look deeper and deeper into the story. It takes place on the seventh Sabbath. Seven meaning the number of completion or perfection. So we're looking at several things have happened to bring us to a moment of completion or perfection. So we look at that. Wow, okay, that would signify that this is a Pentecost moment. And we also find that it was this celebration for the Jewish people of the receiving of the Ten Commandments. So they're looking at the celebration of the receiving of the Torah, that which has been insight into the guiding force for their spiritual lives the Ten Commandments, which were there to help the children of Israel learn how to move and operate and navigate a spiritual life now that they are liberated and free from their bondage. We look at all of this, it says, wow, okay, there's going to be a labor, a harvest. There is a guidance that's being celebrated through those Ten Commandments. There is this wonderful moment of everything coming to a time of perfection and completion. And suddenly we come to our concepts of Pentecost, where we find that the Holy Spirit falling upon those of the early church, and they began to go out and speak in holy boldness. They too had a harvest of first fruits, for they are described in the first chapter of being invited and challenged by Jesus to tarry in Jerusalem and to wait in an upper room and to wait for a period of time in prayer, to be working, or shall we say almost laboring in prayer, to bring about a harvest of the first fruits of the blessing of their time of spiritual awakening. And then we find also the symbolism there of those Ten Commandments that were there being celebrated, being the key uh, tools for guidance in their life. Suddenly now the Holy Spirit is falling upon people, giving guidance for their lives. We find also that this is this wonderful period of time that they went through, bringing them to this moment of celebration of a harvest where they labored in prayer, where they came to this moment where all things were in one accord. So we find also 
that as the Jewish people gathered to celebrate this time, remembering the Ten Commandments, they would come to the temple and they would bring two loaves of bread that were made with yeast. Unusual for them because most time it was unleavened bread. But this bread was bread that had risen, rose, arising, coming up. And two loaves celebrating the two tablets of the Ten Commandments. Wow, all kinds of symbolism unfolding here as we understand what's being unfolding there. But the bread being that of higher understanding. In other words, it's risen bread. It's bread rising. And there were so many nuances that writers would put in that paint word pictures for us. That say, oh, I see the story within the story. Clues that are saying, I know what they're really celebrating. They're celebrating moving in to a higher consciousness, an awareness, an awakening. They're celebrating their labors of their life, now bringing forth first fruits of an aha moment. So the New Testament then speaks and says, when this day arrived, the believers had all come together. They were told to wait in this upper room, to tarry and wait together in a time of prayer and meditation. And when they came together, they were in one place. Wait a minute. I thought they were in one place. What do you mean they're in one place? Where's this place? What are they talking about? What is this place? Is this place? Well, the scripture referred to an upper room. A place is not really a destination, but yet in the story, it is a destination. Let me explain that for you. Because we may all say, I want to go to that upper room. I had the opportunity to go with a tour group that went through Jew Jerusalem. And we had the opportunity to actually come to the place where they called it the upper room. Now, here I was thinking, wow, this is the place where everything happened. This is the place where people came to meditate. And I was thinking that it might be something really spiritual. And, oh, I was so disappointed. It was just an average room. It was just a place. Ah, but the scripture is telling us that they were in one place. And the word place is what may throw us off. Not that they were all in one destination, but the translations also say they were in one accord. Ah, so it's a car, not a room. Oh, okay, I get it. Uh, no, it's not a car. It's not a room. That one place that they're talking about is that one place of a sense of unity and oneness. As the people began to tarry together, as they began to pray together, as they began to meditate today, the day arrived, the day of completion, the day of the moments of perfect perfection within their lives arrived, that it created this Pentecost. It created this celebration. It created this moment. This is the time is now for this to happen. It's not a physical destination that the upper room is, but one in heart and mind. This is the sacred place described. How many of you remember the scripture that says, when you pray, go into your closet and shut the door? And how many of you then think, oh, I need to go in the, house, the, the coat closet, shut the door and pray there because that's my sacred space. It's not at all talking about a destination or a room or a place. It's referring to that sacred place within, that secret place we go within, within our own hearts and our lives. So we go in and we close the door, meaning we shut out all distractions. This is why we invite you as we gather together to take some deep breaths together. As I open up my classes, I always encourage everyone, let's take three deep breaths together, releasing all else as if we are shutting the door to anything else that could be distractions in our world. And let us now center our thoughts and our minds, setting our intentions that we might then uh, allow the spirit to unfold the highest and best in our lives. That's what the scripture is talking about, inviting you to go into your prayer closet, to go into your inner space, to go into that place within mind, within spirit, within heart, where there you go, that you shut the door and you're alone with all that is divine. So this upper room is a place of simply moving to a higher level of understanding, moving to a higher level of spiritual consciousness, moving to a higher level of spiritual awakening. It's not a room. It's an action, you might say. I'm going to the upper room. I'm going to this experience of where I'm lifting up my thoughts. I'm lifting up my spirit. I'm calling it to be awakened to a new place. I'm in this sacred spot in heart and mind, and the door is closed to all else, but I'm in my upper room, this place where I can truly 
experience the highest and best. Years ago, I wanted to buy a condo. I was living in Minneapolis, and a real estate agent took me to several wonderful condos. I said, ah, I've got one special one that I really want you to see. Took me to a fabulous building, and we took the elevator up to the 26th floor to the penthouse. And there it was, opening up the doors to this beautiful condo with a balcony view that was looking over the city of Minneapolis. In fact, the view was so outstanding that the telephone book, the cover of the telephone book for the city of Minneapolis, they came and shot it from that balcony view. And I purchased it. I said, I want this place. Why? Because I have the view that is amazing. And at this higher point, I can see clearly the city around. Pray for the city. Believe for the city. Trust for the city. But I felt like I was in my wonderful higher upper room where I might overlook and see from a great vantage point. So it is when we allow our spiritual life to rise, right? It allows it to come up, rise up a little bit more, rise up to a higher level, move on up, take the elevator up to that penthouse level of understanding and awareness and say, I really want to come to this place where there's a clarity in mind, where I come to a place where I feel I get it when we say I'm in oneness with God. I'm in unity with God. I know what it means to be in one accord. I know it to mean that there is no separation, no division. There's not. The Spirit of God is all around me. The Spirit of God is in me. The Spirit of God, whoa, it's throwing through me, and it's always for me. And when I understand that, that's the understanding of this upper room experience. It's not a destination. It's not a place. It's an experience that we might have within our lives. So each one of these tra these translations that we find of this text that invite us to say it's a place. But what are we talking about when we say this place? It's really this place is a centered moment within heart and life. Because so often we just struggle with understanding this idea of being one with God. We struggle with our concept of God. And I can tell you this. Every day, you need to work on your concept of God. Every day, bring clarity to your concept of who, what is God? How is God working in my life? Because one of the things that we struggle with the most is that concept of God. Because we're always uh, receiving these confusing pictures and ideas. Is God the withholder or is God the great giver? Is God the punisher or is God the giver of grace? Is God the one who made you worthy or are you the one who is unworthy? Are you made in God's image or are you all sinners? And God then uh, looking at us as if we're separate from, are you in your hearts uh, welcoming God or is God in the sky above? Are you and everyone uh, just believing that God is in you but and only like those who think like you and everybody else? Well, they're void of God within them. We have to understand what's our concept of this God, this divine spirit and presence. How do we think? What do we know? What do we understand? And what have we experienced? Because it's so important that we pull all this together, that we refine and work on what is this thing? What is this experience? What is this moment that we call God? Because we have put so many ideas to personalize God. We've created God to be a being. We've put a face on God. We've put a gender on God. We've made God into a father. We've made God into all these things. And they're so limiting in each one of these expressions. They actually confine God in boxes. So it's important that we work daily to say, what do I need to release and let go about my idea about who and what God is. Because the more I liberate God to be God and allow God to be God within my life, the more my experience is of this divine unfolding within me. So when we understand that we, under, uh, we are all in one place, they were all in one place, we understand that they were in this place of higher understanding, that we are understanding being that clear image of the likeness of God that we are so united, as the scripture says, with the divine. I love this passage from the Psalms. It says, for you were created in, uh, you created my inmost being. You created my soul. You created that which is me. The divine created that. 
and you knit me together. And I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Woo, I love that one. You ever say to look in the mirror and say, dang, fearfully and wonderfully made. Look at that. Mm -hmm. Fearfully, not just something, ooh, I'm afraid of this. That doesn't what it means when you look in the mirror. It's just full of this wonderful reverence for all of the creative energy and presence within me. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. This is how God has made, and God dwells within. And then in 1 Corinthians it says, but he who is joined to the Lord awakens to the fact that he is one in the spirit with him. How beautiful it is that we're one with God. So we understand you are made beautifully, and this is the concept of how God creates, that he makes good things. God's creative energy, creative presence is always unfolding the goodness. So when you start questioning and when you start tearing down yourself, and when you start looking in the mirror and start thinking less of yourself, just remember you are criticizing the handiwork of the divine, the expert creator, the ultimate artist. So just allow this wonderful understanding to be yours, that God created me wonderfully, fearlessly, and fabulously, we might add, in, that, in this wonderful process, and knit us together, the soul within, knit us together wove us together, so intertwined that the divine is intertwined with us. When we understand that this truth is moving to a higher level, to an upper room, to the spiritual penthouse in the sky, coming up to this new level of understanding, well, what happens for us is that we understand that Jesus is talking about not a place, but true clarity, true understanding, true uh clean and clear concepts of what the divine is within our lives. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Wow. So what? So Jesus left to go and what, build something? Well, someone said to me, well, he is the son of a carpenter, so maybe he's got some tools, you know? He's gone away. He went up into the sky, up into the heaven, right? And there he's building something for us. The last 2,000 years, he's been hard at work and building something pretty big, right? If that's the case, because you know, here's how we misinterpret these passages of Scripture. Because that passage says, I go to prepare a place for you. For in my Father's house are many mansions. There's, wait a minute, there's lots of mansions inside a house? Now, I've seen a house with lots of rooms. Ah, that's the clarity of, the, of this passage, of understanding what it's trying to say. That in the dwelling place of the divine, in the dwelling place of that which is the source of God. There are many places, many rooms, many aspects, many places where we might dwell within the divine. Wow, I love that. For it really helps us understand this is how infinite God is. It's not just one place. There's many places where we encounter the divine in its uniqueness and its diversity. And there are moments when you encounter the divine in, in maybe times of grieving. And you felt great comfort. Maybe in times of great joy and celebration, you encountered the divine and you felt like laughing. Maybe there's times when you encountered the divine and you went to that place, to that space, to that wonderful experience then of having the love of God comfort you, caress you, hold you, and guide you in your life. In my Father's house are many mansions, many rooms, and I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come back and welcome you into my presence. So not welcome you into the room that I built for you, not welcome you into a, into a house, but welcome you into my presence. And I'm coming back. And so then where is this place? Where do we find Jesus? Where is it? It's a presence. And that presence is found deep within our lives. For the passage of scripture says, invited us always to understand that the kingdom of heaven is within. Jesus went to the realm of God, went to the presence of God, went to the experience of the divine within. And within, the Spirit is saying, there are many places where you will encounter and experience divine encounters of the wonderful expression of that which is God, which is love, and how beautiful and rich this is. So then he says, I'm coming back. And when is he coming back? I love this because every Sunday morning, I drive by a man on Killian Hill and I honk at him because he's got a sign that says, Jesus is coming soon. Okay. I saw that two years ago. How, you know, when is he coming then? Okay. You keep on holding it. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. 
you know, my mother and father who are in their 90s, were in their 90s still proclaimed Jesus was coming soon. Their parents who were lived 100 years before Jesus was coming soon. For thousands of years, people said, Jesus is coming. When is this soon? And when is he coming? Because how long do we wait? Because you said he was coming. And Jesus said, I went to prepare a place for you, and I'm coming back. What, in the year 5,000? Again, people have got this crazy misconception and this confusion. I'm going to tell you this. What Jesus was talking about is Jesus is the Christ, right? Okay. What is the Christ? That's not his last name. Okay, not Jesus Christ, Mr. and Mrs. Christ having a baby named Christ, <laughs> Jesus Christ. That is not what it is at all. Jesus the Christ, the Christ is a Christ, a consciousness, an awareness of who you are, an awareness that he was the son of God. Okay, awareness that he was the heir to all the good of God. Oh, awareness that he was heir to all the blessings. Everything was there. And he invites us to understand that you too can come to this awakening, this Christ consciousness, this awareness that you are the heir, that you are the sons and daughters of God. Okay? So when we understand this, that this consciousness, then, well, it's available to us any day and every day. I want to tell you this. Jesus came yesterday. Jesus comes today. And Jesus will come tomorrow. That Christ consciousness that Jesus was embodying is there for you every day of your life. Came yesterday. Were you ready? You may not have been ready, and you missed out. Comes today. Are you ready? You may miss out. He'll come tomorrow. Will you be ready? You may miss it again. But it, that consciousness is available to us every single day of our life. We need not hold up signs that say that Jesus is coming in the clouds someday. Jesus is coming in a heavenly experience. This Christ consciousness, this awakening for our life, happens every single day of our life if you are willing and open. And you experience it in that upper room experience, that sacred space, that secret closet. That's what's being described for us, the story within the story. It says, in that day you will know I am in my Father and you in me. And I in you. Whoa, wait a minute. What's going on here? You know, who's inside who? What's going on there? You see how we are with literalism? We miss the story behind the story, the meaning within. Because what it's saying is that there is such a oneness that you don't know the difference between Jesus and God. And you don't know the difference between Jesus and you. And you don't know the difference between you and God. And you don't know the difference between you and Jesus. There is such a oneness because you are in God and God is in you. And there's this wonderful sense of what it means to be lost in this beautiful experience of being so one with the divine. Wow. That means that the power and presence of God is with you, never leaving nor forsaking you. It's inside you. Did you imagine what it would be like if we all awakened to this kind of experience? where we said, I have the power of God within me. I have the power of God within me. It's flowing in me. It's through me. I have the wisdom of God in me. Ooh, I, could, I have the, all infinite possibilities within me. Could you imagine what your life would be like if you really believed that? You took it to heart 100%. But that was the expectation. For Jesus said, I've gone to prepare a place for you, and I'm coming for you that there you may be also. Not when you die. But every single day of your life that you may be found within this wonderful presence. It's a presence that fills us, that you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a lot of people who want to say, wait a minute, what is being filled with the Holy Spirit? In the Pentecostal movement, they believe in the baptism of speaking in tongues. I came from that background years ago growing up in the Pentecostal church. There are other people who describe being filled with the Spirit in different ways. Let me tell you, this is what the Spirit is. This is the awakening, the awareness, the dawning, the complete acknowledgement that you are already filled with the Spirit. Is this wonderful revelation. You see, Jesus in his baptism had this great moment of the Spirit descending like a dove over him saying, this is my beloved in whom I'm well pleased. 
It was this spirit filling him with this full awareness that you are already God's good pleasure. You're already there, and the spirit is already we dwells within you. It's just calling you to awaken it, to release it, to acknowledge it, and to live it. For this place is a spiritual place. It is there this wonderful understanding of that you have a consciousness, you have a subconscious, and then there's this super consciousness. Okay? That's the wonderful trinity, you might say. We have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, so it is that we find that this wonderful consciousness of thought, and then there is subconscious of mind manifesting, and then there's this super consciousness of the universal infinite intelligence that's there. So we have this wonderful God inspiration living and existing and manifesting through man, through Jesus, shall we say, in this Trinity expression. And the Holy Spirit being that infinite knowledge and guidance that's there for our life, a super consciousness. And a, like, oh, wow, there's more. Oh, and I'm filled with this super consciousness. Yes, I have thoughts. Yes, within my subconscious, I operate from my subconscious, doing things subconsciously. Now I awaken to the fact I'm filled with the Spirit, a super consciousness that says infinite knowledge, infinite wisdom, infinite understanding is available to me. It's mine. This is how wonderful it is because it describes how beautiful that this place is a current, a spiritual current. A wind, you might say, a wind that is moving through uh, our in our lives. For as that day of Pentecost is described, it says there was a mighty rushing wind, a wind that came into their lives, a wind of awakening, as a, a spiritual current that says, I get it. Ah, aha, I understand. They had tarried so long, praying together, believing together. Oh, let me tell you this, church. If you want to have something miraculous happen in your life, get with a group of people and start praying together. Start meditating together. Why? Because you're raising consciousness. You're moving up the elevator to the upper room. You are igniting this wonderful presence of the Holy Spirit, this infinite knowledge, this super consciousness, this awakening. You're rising it up within your own life and you're enabling it to come to its fruition. And within you that you are now filled with a dynamic power. For what do we know about this whole story? It says the early church, they believed, they prayed together this upper room. Suddenly the day of Pentecost comes and what do they do? They go out and start speaking. They go out and start telling the good news. Now it's described in this way as they start flames, uh, cloven tongues were above their heads. I don't know. Uh, you know, again, we get so biblical literalism. We think, okay, there's flaming things. Whole new meaning to word flaming queen when you've got that idea that you know there's a fire up above your head that's on fire that's going above it. That is not it at all. It's a, a word picture of the story within the story. First of all, we understand the word of those divided tongues or cloven tongues. Someone who spoke with cloven tongues is someone, it's an idiom in the Aramaic language, it would say they spoke with great clarity. That's what it means. So in other words, there was a spirit resting upon them that was symbolized like a fire, a flame, like a clo like divided flame, but it meant that they were speaking with such a fire and fervency of, clarence, uh, of clarity, of, of really knowing exactly what they're saying, what's going on within their life. They begin to say, why? Why was there such a fire within them? Why was there such a boldness? Because they knew and they experienced. This is the thing in our lives. It's really something to know something, right? You learn in school. And there's really something about experiencing it. But there's something amazing when you know and experience. And you put it together. It's life transforming. Those who said, I walked with Jesus. I heard his teaching. I understand everything he said. Now they're praying in an upper room together. In this time, this season of meditation, of centering and awakening within them, 
created an experience within them and experiences this I know to be true because I've lived it out. I know it firsthand within my life. And the labor of this is my first fruits because I had this aha, this wonderful awakening, this moment. This now it's not, let me tell you this first discovery. Y'all remember your first, don't you? Your first kiss, your first boyfriend, first girlfriend, your first experience driving a car, your first experience out of high school, your first experience in your new home, your first child. We all remember our first. Something about the first, we put some extra passion to it because we've never experienced it before and it's so fresh and so new. The first. Now, I know y'all have been kissed 101 times. Some of you too many times, I know. But uh, I'm telling you, you still remember the first and the first one was always, whoo, so wonderful, so amazing, so powerful. I want to tell you this. Here's what's happening in this body of believers. Their time of laboring and prayer awakened like a harvest, a first fruit, a first fruit of like, whoa, I have experienced it, what I know to be true, and I'm going to go out and tell the world. And suddenly they're walking through this celebration and this festival, and they're going out to tell the good news with such boldness within them and such clarity within them because they said, I know what I know what I know to be true because I just experienced it. I had this Pentecostal filling of the spirit within me, an awakening. I've been in this upper room. And it's dynamic and it's wonderful. And world, let me tell you about it. And I'm going to speak with such clear, clearance, clear, clarity. Get it out. I'm going to speak with such a clarity within uh, my words that people of different backgrounds, different languages, are going to get it, understand it. And I'm going to speak in such a way that there's like, oh, yeah. Let me tell you this. Let's go back to your first experience with God. You remember that? Your first experience, maybe it was a childhood experience. I can remember as a young child, remembering the very love of God in my heart and my life. I'll never forget these moments of feeling though I was different, unique, special. Uh, I knew that the love of God was there. And when, I, when it just dawned on me, that no matter what the world says, no matter what's going on in my community around me, no matter what's in my social environment, I know that the love of God surrounds me. It's in me. It's through me. It's always for me. And wow, that was so amazing. I can remember calling all my friends as being a young child and saying, I feel God. And they're like, okay, whatever, you know. No, let me describe it to you. And I began to describe this wonderful love that's flowing in and through my life. And as a young man, as I grew up uh, throughout my teen years being very confused, I remember that there were times when I tarried and I waited and I prayed. And once again, I felt the love of God. I felt that divine presence. And I wanted to go and tell everybody. So I gathered teenagers and I formed a Bible study in my high school and began to tell everybody. You see, there was a fire within me that says, I've got to tell what I know and what I've experienced. You wonder why the churches in America are dying. Church attendance is drifting off. No matter what denomination you're part of, Catholic Church will acknowledge it's closed many of its churches. Methodist, Presbyterian, New Thought, MCC. doesn't matter what denomination it is. Churches are closing. In fact, they say that we are closing about 4,000 churches a year. That's a lot. Saying, you know, people stop going. People no longer attend. They can't, they can't afford a pastor. We can't find someone to come and preach and teach. What's happened is the holy boldness is gone out. Of people saying, this I know and this I've experienced. You see, a lot of people know but haven't experienced. A lot of people experience, but they don't know what they've experienced. But it's when we put it together that we say, I know this and I've experienced it. That's a Pentecostal moment. That's a moment that ignites a fire where we can say, I can speak with clarity about it. Today, there's a lot of people who would say, you know, I, I go to family reunions or gatherings and they ask me about the church I go to. And uh, 
I don't know how to explain it to them. I don't even know what to say. I'm going to say, here's what you say. You tell them what you've experienced. You tell them what you know. And you know that you've experienced it. And how you know you've experienced it. And how what you experienced is true for you. And when we do that, we will add to the church. Because what did the scripture say in Acts chapter 2? That they went out with a holy boldness and these believers went out and began to speak and preach and teach and shall we just talk to people? And it said in one day, 3,000 people were added and that began the birth of the Christian movement, of the movement of the awakening of the spirit of God within people's lives and it began to spread until today we're here at City of Light in the year 2019. Because of this wonderful movement of people saying, this I know, this I've experienced, and let me tell it to you. And I can do it with clarity. How do I know I can do it with clarity? Because I spent time with God in my upper room. I spent time in my prayer closet, and I shut the door. And if we have trouble saying, well, I haven't experienced anything wonderful, and I, have, I, don't, I don't really know what I know, and I, I can't do all that. Time to get to the upper room then. Time to get to our prayer closet. It's time to shut the door. It's time to say, I need to have this quiet time because there will be a harvest of first fruits and there will be a benefit of your time in prayer that you'll look as if you are harvesting some wonderful fruit for your spiritual life. It will happen for you when you tarry when you wait. Because this story is our story. This story filled with all these nuances and symbolism. I think it's so important because sometimes I think this story is filled with more symbols and nuances than most stories are. Why? Because I think the writer said, I really want you to get this. I really want you to get this. So I'm going to paint the picture in so many different ways. I'm going to paint this to say, do you see how the Holy Spirit is like the Ten Commandments guiding you? Do you see how this festival of first fruits is there when you spend your time in prayer? You will reap and you need to celebrate it. Do you see uh, the wonderful symbolism there of people coming together in an upper room and what that means for you when you get into not a room that's on the 26th floor, but into an upper a space of higher consciousness? Do you understand what it means when it says that I go to prepare a place for you and that place is not a destination, but a place within your heart, a space and awareness and awakening within you? Do you understand all these things that the authors were trying to get across? Because I'm going to fill it with so much symbolism because I want you to get this. Because this is how the church birthed. This is what was the impetus for what we celebrate thousands of years later a movement that was founded and grounded in this wonderful experience. So I want to tell you that the day of Pentecost has arrived. It's here. It's here and it's for us to celebrate, not out of tradition, but to celebrate in a genuine way in our life that today and every day is my day of Pentecost, that I've come together and I'm in this one place, not a room, but the place of oneness, of unity with God, so fully aware that there is no separation, that I move within the world and I say, I am the divine. And it's not blasphemous. Why is it not blasphemous? Because the divine has so consumed me. I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Jesus in the Father, and the Father in him, and invites you to say, you are in me, and I am in you. And when we awaken to that, that's how the miraculous happens. That's Pentecost. Amen.